On a technical side, there are certain so we say parts of the car that should have been designed that we've come across that haven't quite been finished, certain parts that should have been made that for one reason or another haven't been made, so we have to find someone that can do them extremely quickly. We're using a lot of volunteer work at the moment. The nature of the project has to be that we need volunteers to carry on with the work. All the volunteers we're getting have to be um, aircraft standard fitters, very good. We have hundreds of people that have phoned volunteering. When we talk to them, or when I talk to them, I whittle them down. We've got somewhere in the region of 21, 22 volunteers that come in on their own time, whenever they can. Thrust is powered by two massive Spey engines taken from a Phantom jet fighter, producing more than 100,000 horsepower, enough to drive 1,000 family cars. With a speed of 0 to 600 in 16 seconds, how would Andy Green escape if something went wrong? In conventional jet aircraft, should a pilot have to, he can use the ejector seat to escape. Thrust, however, has no provision for this. The reason for not having an ejection seat is because ejection seats actually take a finite time to function. It's only about less than half a second, but half a second at 700 miles an hour is a lot of time, it's a lot of distance, a lot of things can happen. Our abort system will function something like 20 times faster than an ejection seat uh, to actually control the car, keep the nose on the ground, jack the, uh, the tail up, put the parachutes out, all of that can happen in the same length of time that an ejection seat would actually start to leave the car. The other problem is ejecting supersonic at low level. The actual dynamic pressure is in the order of half a tonne per square foot. That is an incredibly unhealthy thing to do to actually jump out to an airflow like that. Thrust is the most sophisticated record car ever built. Along with computerized monitoring systems, it also has a unique active suspension which controls the angle of the car. This is the rear um, active suspension of the car. It has two elements to it. The lower element here is the passive element. This deals with small undulations in the surface. Uh, the high frequency stuff as the wheel vibrates on the ground, this will control that. The upper element controls the overall pitch of the car and therein lies the stability of the car. If you change the pitch angle of the car, you change the aerodynamics of the car, you change the aerodynamics of the car, you change the lift of the car. Equally impressive are the wheels. At its potential maximum speed of 850 miles per hour, Thrust's aluminium alloy wheels will rotate 14 times a second and could be subjected to forces of nearly 45,000 pounds per square inch. Um, I'll give you a typical figure that any point at maximum speed on the jet car, any point on the surface of the wheel will have an outward acceleration of 35,000 g which is a phenomenal figure. And that's the kind of forces which are trying to tear that wheel to pieces. And we have to design it such that in fact that doesn't happen, that it stays together and does the job. Starting up the car then, first thing is to switch on the batteries, check that the uh, electrics come up to power, 24 volts on the main battery, checking the fuel quantity and all the lights. Andy Green had spent hundreds of hours on the simulator, familiarizing himself with the cockpit, which he helped design. Against the lock brakes on the desert, so brakes off, easing the power up, and as the car accelerates, trying to keep it straight, accelerating fairly gradually at first, but already doing 100 miles an hour. It's slightly unstable, the engines are now at full power, selecting full afterburner, checking the thrust balance, and accelerating through 250 miles an hour as the afterburners bite. Accelerating now with 20 tons of thrust, almost twice the force of gravity, adding 40 miles an hour per second to the speed. Still struggling to keep the car straight as it slides on the desert surface. Approaching the first measured mile markers into halfway through the measured mile, already accelerating through 400 miles an hour. Coming to the end of the first measured mile there, and we're doing just over 500 miles an hour. Already doing 0.8, i.e. 80% of the speed of sound. Coming through now, now approaching 600 miles an hour. This is the current world land speed record, two miles into the run. Coming up to the speed of sound, Approaching 0.9 now, 0 0.95, 0 0.97, 0 0.98, and Mach 1. We're now supersonic, doing 750 miles an hour, covering a mile every five seconds. Four miles now into the run, Mach, Mach 1.05, approaching the measured mile, entering it now, Mach 1.1, 1 .1, 830 miles an hour. Cover the measured mile in four and a half seconds, exiting the measured mile at Mach 1.1, .1, double green boards go past, and slowing down, taking the power off, and putting the chutes out. And that's how you break the sand barrier. It's something that the general public tend to perceive as being dangerous, land speed record braking. You know, it's, well, obviously driving really fast is really dangerous. You know, if, if driving fast down the motorway is dangerous, then driving even faster must be even more dangerous. The thing is, of course, 
you're controlling the environment totally. The car is designed to be most stable at Mach 1 in the same way that uh, flying an aircraft. First time the aeroplanes tried to go supersonic, they started breaking up, crashing, doing all sorts of nasty things because they weren't designed for it. We've actually gone a step beyond and designed the car to be totally stable at Mach 1. Thrust will only ever be driven in a straight line. Green, however, had to train for any eventuality. What we're trying to do is to improve his, his ability to control a vehicle, different types of vehicle. And what you have to do is you have to be able to react to the car going out of line and react to that very rapidly. If you let a skid build up too much before you react to it, then you're history. Um, in thrust with Andy, it's sort of a very similar thing, you know, except he's driving in a dead straight line. But when the vehicle starts to go slightly out of line, or if the front or back tyres sort of slide a little bit out of line, he's got to react with the steering immediately. Uh, and if he doesn't, then it, obviously the consequences are pretty serious. That's 54.1. Your entry speeds are quite good. Try and break, break a bit later, but keep the same entry speed to the corner. He's got all the, the things that you need to be a racing driver. I mean, he's got great coordination, um, great ability to, to sort of control the car. But also, he's got combined with that, he's a very, very competitive person as well. By summer 1996, schedules were slipping fast. Every day lost cost money, and that was already tight. Richard Noble was forever fighting the battle to raise funds. The team was now working seven days a week to complete the car, and everyone was feeling the pressure. We're pretty tired, but uh, that's the nature of the game, really. Keep on uh, going. Work long hours, minimal sleep. Eat when you can. But, uh, you get there in the end. I think the only major problem is the one of time. What seemed a reasonable time to do it all in just wasn't in the end. It wasn't very practical. <laughs> uh, but other than that, no. The, the parts have fitted all right. They've gone into the machine and they've, uh, the wheels have turned through the right angles and, and so on. I think one of the problems in the past, we've set ourselves targets that really we couldn't meet. And once we're happy with the engines, it's on the runway. <laughs> and then it rolls for real. August the 12th, 1996. At last, Thrust was at Boscombe Down in Wiltshire for her tie-down tests. Today is a fundamental milestone because uh, today we, uh, we try out all the systems on the car for the first time we can run the engines up to full power, that means we can run up the uh, uh, electric systems, the hydraulic systems, we can check to see whether the uh, fuel system's leaking, the hydraulic system's leaking, it's absolutely fundamental. After thousands of hours of hard work, the engines fired up for the first time. For the select few, the tension grew as Andy Green slowly opened the throttles. As thrust engines almost reached full power, there was a surge, a shortage of air much like a fuel blockage. Well, what we've learned basically is that we've got most of the car right, um, something like about 90% of the car right. Well, this is an extreme example where what we're doing is running up the engines um, when the car isn't moving forward. So, hence there's an enormous uh, loss of pressure in each of the um, intakes. And basically we have an intake problem at that very extreme condition. So when the car is actually running fast, of course, you've got a great column of air waiting to go into the intake. So it all, uh, you know, it pressurizes. It's, it won't be a problem at speed. It's purely a problem when we're stationary. But we've got to get it right, and uh, we can't go on until we do. Two days later at Farnborough, the team chose a novel way to unravel why not enough air was getting into the engines. By spraying water in front of the intakes, it was possible to see a vortex or whirlpool where the problem might be.
The next day, they returned to Boscombe Down. Again, a surge. Another day wasted. Oh, it's certainly a disappointment, simply because the indications yesterday were that we'd cured it, as you say. The fact that we find we've still got a problem, uh, yes, OK, back to uh, um, some more hard thinking and a bit more research. A few days later, the team came up with an ingenious solution. Basically the problem was, because it was a very sharp intake lip, the air was going over the intake lip and breaking away, um, and then actually starting to distort, and the shape of the intake then never lets it recover. Where they sort this in test beds is to actually put a bell mouth, uh, which is just a nice smooth sort of uh, cone shape, uh, or literally just like a, the mouth of a bell, on the end of the engine to smooth the air passage into it. So we've got a standard engine test bed one, and we're now fiberglass moulding it to actually turn it into the right shape to actually fit right on the front of the car. Um, exactly as we did the last tie down, but with a bell mouth on as well. It will basically just smooth the airflow around the corner, straight down the engine, and hopefully increase the flow down the engine by, they estimate something like between 10 and 20 percent, which would be more than enough. The bell mouth was successful, and Noble was ready to unveil thrust to the world. Morning, everybody. Um, this is what record breaking is all about. This is, you're really seeing it raw. This is not contrived, this is exactly what's happening. And today, you're going to see a great moment. We're actually going to move this car, and it's going to move under its own power. After 18 months of hard work and disappointments, Thrust was ready for her maiden run. I've got a really nice feeling about it now, you know. It's, um, it's been a long, long, long haul, but it's... Uh, it's you feel it gradually coming together, you know, get better and better and better. <laughs> On her debut appearance, and in front of the world's press, it seemed that Thrust was having first-night nerves. We've got a tiny little fuel leak on one of the engines, which, I mean, it, you know, literally it's insignificant. We could have run with that quite happily. I'm sitting in the car saying, go on, go on, let's go for it. And the guy's thoroughly professional decision, despite however much they wanted to see the car run, they actually said, no, not sensible, we go back in, we do it again another time. It was almost four weeks later when Thrust was given another chance. This is the alternative SSC funding. We do post offices dressed like this. <laughs> First time, Thrust was running on her own engines. Thrust was using rubber wheels for short testing runs. Incredibly, the car designed to break the sound barrier had a simple tyre burst. Water bugger. 